then a very good evening. You're watching Primetime News on TV1. For the News First team, I'm Dasni Athada, along with our interpreter tonight, Taraka Gabriel, who is joining you via Zoom. Let's start off with a look at tonight's headlines. Residents of Colombo continue to protest over the 5,000 rupee allowance. Isolation status to be lifted in six police jurisdictions with effect from 5 a.m. tomorrow. Another seven Grama Seva divisions isolated. Several factions oppose the reopening of schools. Secretary to the subject ministry says he will take responsibility. Who attempted to mine sand illegally from Hadaoya? Final rites of the Mahanayaka of the Ramani sect, most venerable Napane Pemasiri Thera, carried out with state honours. President Gotabe Rajapaksa paid homage to the Temple of the Sacred Tooth Relic in Kandy today. President Rajapaksa, who arrived in Kandy this morning, paid homage to the Temple of the Sacred Tooth Relic and engaged in religious observances. Subsequently, President Rajapaksa met with the Diyavadana Nilame, Nilanga Dala, and engaged in a cordial discussion. Meanwhile, residents of several housing complexes located in two police jurisdictions in the western province, which are currently under isolation, took to the streets today as well, claiming that the concessions granted to them during the lockdown are insufficient. <laughs> A group of residents of the Randia Uena housing complex in the Modra police jurisdiction staged a protest for approximately one hour, claiming that the concessions granted to them during the lockdown are insufficient. More than 1,000 families living in this housing scheme make ends meet with the income they generate on a daily basis. Residents of this housing complex point out that the COVID-19 crisis has severely affected their livelihoods. What can you purchase for 5,000 rupees? One kilogram of rice is 120 rupees. The government said the price of a kilogram of sugar will be reduced to 80 rupees. But where can you purchase sugar for that price? How can 5,000 rupees be enough to support a family with three kids? People will die out of hunger, not from COVID-19. How can we earn a living to make ends meet? People are going to die out of hunger, not from the coronavirus. We have children to feed. Everyone visited us before the election, but today there is no one to help us, even with some food. <laughs> Minister Vimal Veeravansha told us to purchase our monthly requirements with the 5,000 rupee allowance. 5,000 rupees is not enough to purchase items for a month. You can only purchase items for a week. The OIC of the Modera Police, Janaka Kumara, arrived at the scene of the protest. A decision on whether the lockdown in the area will be lifted or not will be based on the results of the PCR test carried out. Protesting will only prolong the situation. So please go back to your houses. The protest, which lasted for more than an hour, ended after the crowds dispersed upon the promise made by the Modera OIC that a solution to this issue will be delivered by tomorrow. Meanwhile, 68 residents of the Jayamaga housing complex in Grand Pass took to the streets this morning demanding for further financial support from the government. We have nothing, not even a little sugar to prepare a cup of tea for our children. A few hours ago, two residents fainted out of hunger. That is how desperate we are. No one cares. A minister on TV had said, why can't we survive with the 5,000 rupee allowance for at least a week? But the cost for an injection for their pet dogs exceeds 20,000 for a week. We cannot survive for two months with 5,000. There are 68 families here. Each house accommodates more than two families. Subsequently, the acting OIC of the Grand Pass Police Station, Chief Inspector Renuka Gamke, arrived at the scene. 
The government as a policy will provide the 5,000 rupee allowance. In addition, if you are directed to quarantine, you will be given a food hamper. I spoke to the divisional secretary and she said that the allowance has already been distributed. What is the problem now? No one visited us. We are daily wage laborers. We earn a living on a daily basis. According to our correspondent, the protesters dispersed after the divisional secretary promised to provide a solution. In my view, all measures have been taken to minimize the inconvenience caused to the general public. Various views are being expressed in this regard. Considering the inconvenience caused to the general public and the health guidelines provided by the health authorities, certain areas will continue to be isolated for another week starting from tomorrow morning. Meanwhile, the progress review meeting on the prevention of COVID-19 in Devlapitiya was held at the Divisional Secretariat Office in Devlapitiya under the auspices of Minister Indika Anuruddha. Officials from several sectors, including security and health, were also present at the meeting. Your committee is empowered to ensure people will remain indoors and abide by quarantine regulations. Members of this committee can visit houses and take action in this regard. For instance, children could spread the virus by going to school. This could lead to another complicated situation. If various groups direct individuals to quarantine, there would be no use in such measures. When I visited Nigambu recently, I witnessed people standing in queues longer than a kilometer to obtain money. It is clear that something has gone wrong in the process. Why should queues be formed in the first place? In Nigambo, about six families live in a 10 perch plot of land. The current system in place has helped in curbing the spread of the virus and I urge all of you to work within this system. The political authorities and state officials, including those at the Divisional Secretariat, will have to take the responsibility if something goes wrong. There is no point in holding the people accountable. The public is helpless. The National Operations Centre for the Prevention of COVID-19 Outbreak has said that the isolation status in six police jurisdictions will be lifted at 5 a.m. tomorrow. Accordingly, the Borella, Vallampitiya, Colombo Fort, Slave Island police jurisdictions in the Colombo district will not be isolated from tomorrow. However, authorities said that the Vanathamulla Gramaniladari Division in Borella and the Varkanda Gramaniladari Division in the Slave Island area will continue to remain isolated. In the Colombo district, the Matakulia, Modara, Blumendal, Kotahena, Grand Pass, Fosho, Wolfendal, Maligavatta, Dematagoda, Keselvatta, Maradana, Peta and Dam Street police jurisdictions will remain isolated until further notice. Meanwhile, the isolation status in the Jaila and Kadavata police jurisdictions will also be lifted from 5 a.m. tomorrow. However, the Nigambo, Ragama, Vattala, Paliagoda and Kalania police jurisdictions will continue to remain isolated. Issuing a statement, the Department of Government Information said that seven Gramaniladari divisions in the Bandaragama police jurisdiction in the Kalutara district have been declared as isolated areas. These areas include the Boghavata Gramaniladari division, Bamunumulla Gramaniladari division, Kirimantudava, Koralava, Atalugama, Bamunumulla West, and Galhamandia Gramaniladari divisions. <laughs> The isolation status in certain areas is lifted due to the support extended by its residents. We did not detect COVID-19 patients or subclusters from these areas since the people abided by the restrictions. This allowed us to lift the isolation status. A mother who escaped with her child from the infectious diseases hospital while being treated for COVID-19 was located at a remote area in Hindurangala, Ahaliyagoda last evening. <laughs> Police said that the woman had been remanded after being nabbed with 1.5 grams of heroin recently. Yeah,
The 25-year-old woman who is facing narcotics-related charges had been remanded at the Kuruvita prison and had been allowed to keep her two-and-a-half-year-old child in her possession. The mother and the child, who were admitted to the Infectious Diseases Hospital after testing positive for COVID-19, had fled the facility on Friday. Police said the woman was directed to a quarantine center in Polonnaruwa after being located last evening. Meanwhile, occupants of a relative's residence in Ahalyagoda, at which the mother had dropped off her child during the escape attempt, has been subjected to quarantine as well. <laughs> We have recorded a statement from the woman. She has confessed to escaping the hospital through a window and then travelling to Ahaliagoda in a three-wheeler and by bus. We are investigating the authenticity of her statement with the support of the intelligence units. If her statement is found to be true, the three-wheeler driver and those who travel on the bus will be subject to quarantine. Another 175 COVID-19 cases were reported in the island today. According to the Epidemiology Unit of the Ministry of Health, 479 COVID-19 patients have recovered, bringing the total number of recoveries to 14,069. The number of confirmed COVID-19 cases in the country rose to 19,946. The number of active patients currently under medical supervision stands at 5,794. No deaths due to COVID-19 were reported so far today. The COVID-19 dead toll in the country currently stands at 83. Nine people died of COVID-19 yesterday, the highest number of deaths reported in a day. The Department of Government Information said three of the diseased had passed away while receiving treatment at the Colombo National Hospital. Among the diseased was a 57-year-old male from Colombo II who passed away due to COVID-19-related pneumonia and shock, a 65-year-old male from Vellampitiya who had passed away due to high blood pressure, diabetes and COVID-19 infection, and an 89-year-old male from Dematagoda who passed away due to COVID-19-related pneumonia. A 76-year-old male from Vellavatta passed away at the Mulleriava Base Hospital due to COVID-19-related pneumonia, bacterial infection and shock. A 75-year-old female from Vellampitiya who transferred to the Homagama Base Hospital also passed away due to COVID-19 infection and exacerbated pneumonia. A 76-year-old female who was identified as a COVID-19 infected patient at a private hospital in Colombo and was transferred to the IDH for treatment passed away due to COVID-19 pneumonia and blood infection. According to the Department of Government Information, the remaining three victims had passed away at their respective residences. A 48-year-old female from Colombo 10 and a 69-year-old female from Colombo 13 had passed away at their residences due to the COVID-19 infection resulting in cardiac arrest. Another 72-year-old male from Colombo 10 has passed away at his residence. The cause of death was ruled as diabetes, high blood pressure and COVID-19 infection resulting in cardiac arrest. This raises the total death toll due to COVID-19 in the country to 83. Schools are set to reopen tomorrow in all parts of the country, excluding the western province and areas that are under isolation. Issuing a statement, the Education Ministry said that students from grades 6 to 13 will be allowed to attend school from tomorrow. Our cameras captured the arrangements that were being made on the eve of commencing the new academic term. We wish to ask the Public Health Inspectors Union whether the government has provided them with the needful to ensure the safety of students. Therefore, the Health Services Director General must declare that he would bear responsibility for any repercussions that may be caused due to this move. He must undertake the responsibility of ensuring that a COVID-19 cluster does not emerge in schools. Forty-four schools in the Kurunagala Municipality Limit, including Maliadeva College, Maliadeva Girls College, Vayambaraya College and St. Anne's College will not reopen tomorrow. All schools in the Putlam district will reopen tomorrow in line with the government's decision. But we have restricted entry to students. Principals, academic and non-academic staff can report to work. We hope to delay the resumption of academic sessions only by a week. Students can attend schools on the 30th of this month.
Certain key figures in the government have not accepted this decision. The governor of the northwestern province has decided to delay the reopening of schools in areas that are not under lockdown. Therefore, there is a danger that a COVID-19 cluster can emerge in schools due to this hasty decision of the government. They claim credit for restoring normalcy in the country to portray a good image to the international community. However, the government has been making foolish decisions. We have been informed that certain teachers in the Gampaha district have been notified to report to work despite the restrictions. Why is this being done when the education ministry has declared that schools cannot be opened in the western province? <laughs> Schools in all areas except the western province will not reopen for primary grades from tomorrow. However, the teachers of the primary grades have not been informed whether they should report to work or not. No instruction has been communicated to them yet. The decisions of the education ministry are implemented through zonal educational offices. But teachers are not allowed to enter these offices due to COVID-19 fears. While the officials remain in hiding, teachers have been asked to report to work. <laughs> Meanwhile, the police have said that special attention would be paid towards school transport services for students that will recommence tomorrow. We have informed police officers to monitor whether the transportation of students to schools is taking place in compliance with the health guidelines. We have no intention to stop and inspect vehicles or take any other legal action as it would delay the arrival of students. We only intend to monitor where the students are being transported in a way that would prevent them from contracting COVID-19. <laughs> Trade unions have raised cautions on reopening schools at a time in which the COVID-19 pandemic has not been brought under complete control. Why are they reopening schools in a hurry? Will the government bear responsibility for these students? If the government is trying to shirk their responsibility by entrusting school development committees, past pupil associations and public health inspectors with the task of handling this process, they are attempting to use children as scapegoats. School transport service unions have complained that they cannot transport half the capacity at a time. Against such a backdrop, if a COVID-19 cluster emerges at schools, who will bear responsibility for the future of these children? It is the responsibility of those serving in official capacities to provide children with education. It is the education secretary and relevant officials who should bear responsibility for this exercise that is being carried out in the name of education for the betterment of the public. We hope to increase the financial provisions for this sector up to 280 million rupees. Based on the student population, we hope to disperse 105.8 million to all nine provinces. Residents of Kahandamodara Ranna have objected against allowing a tourist hotel in the area to be used as a quarantine centre for players involved in the Lanka Premier League tournament organised by Sri Lanka Cricket. The public will come into contact with this facility, therefore display a notice declaring this as a quarantine centre just like it has been done in other similar facilities. If entry to the hotel is restricted, that would help in ensuring the safety of the employees as well. Therefore, we are demanding a special security plan to be drawn up in this regard. Publish a notice identifying this facility as a quarantine centre, then we would not come into contact with them. News First has continued to expose how natural resources in the country are being destroyed in the name of development projects. Residents of Ampara are complaining that the Hana Oya is now facing a similar threat. The Hada Oya River in Ampara that cuts across the Kumbukkan Forest Reserve and the Lahugala National Park has now become a target of sand racketeers in the country. The sand deposit of the river that runs from Munaragala to Panama is located in the Kumbukkan Reserve. Entry to the reserve and sand mining has been banned due to its environmental importance. However, area residents allege that various groups are attempting to mine sand from this river under the name of various political figures by claiming to have obtained legal approval. The latest incident that bore testament to their claims took place yesterday. 
Residents opposed the group that attempted to enter the forest reserve to inspect the sand deposit by claiming they have received approval for the visit. Various entities are engaged in tussle to destroy this river that is a resource to us. Therefore, we are requesting the president to prevent these activities from taking place as they are tarnishing the image of the government. Do not allow these groups to thrive on illegal activities. These racketeers cannot stand the sight of rivers and streams. They must be stopped. That is why we have elected you into power. Our village will not allow anything harmful to occur. They claim to be from NGOs who have the approval of the Irrigation Ministry. We request the President to prevent them from destroying the country's resources. The final practical training exercise of the Disaster Response Training Course conducted by the Sri Lanka Army Disaster Response Training Centre was conducted today. The training was conducted at the Kothmale Reservoir. The Army Commander was also present at the occasion. The Indian High Commissioner to Sri Lanka, His Excellency Gopal Bagle, called on the chief incumbent of the Sri Subuti Viharaya, Venerable Vaskadwe Mahinda Vanchathera, and obtained his blessings. Buddhism is the heritage for the whole of the world and India and Sri Lanka have a special role to strengthen not only their ties in Buddhism and uh, the, their cooperation but the message of Buddha for the whole world. So uh, India's Prime Minister Sri Narendra Modi has recently announced a grant of 15 million dollars for strengthening these ties. We are actually in touch with the government of Sri Lanka with the Buddhist Asana Ministry to uh, work out the details. Prime Minister of India, Sri Narendra Modi, has taken the initiative to make the Kushinagar Airport, where the Buddha attained Mahaparinirvana, as an international airport. And uh, both countries are working to make the first international flight to Kushinagar from Sri Lanka. So we hope that the first international flight of uh, uh, pilgrims to Kushinagar uh, after it has become international airport will be from Sri Lanka. The final rites of most venerable Napane Pemasiri Thera, who served as the chief prelate of the Ramanya sect, was held with full state honours today. This was at the grounds of the SWRD Bandaranaika National School in Kundasale. <laughs> The remains of the chief prelate of the Ramana sect, most venerable Napana Pemasiri Thera, were laid in repose at the Sri Vidya Sagara Pirivan Temple in Manikhinna. 
Prime Minister Mahindra Rajapaksa and Opposition Leader Sajid Premadasa were among those who paid their last respects to the late Chief Prelate this afternoon. Venerable Napana Pema Siritera passed away on the 17th of this month at the age of 98 while receiving treatment at the Peradinia Teaching Hospital. The final rites were held at the grounds of the SWRD Bandaranaika National School in Kundasale with full state honours today. President Gotabi Rajapaksa was among those present. A religious ceremony to offer a cloth on behalf of the deceased was carried out by the newly appointed chief prelate of the Ramanistek, Most Venerable Makuluave Vimalatera. He lived a very humble life filled with religious virtues and principles, making him one of the highly respected figures in the community. As a person who grew under his shade from a very young age, I have observed that his accession to the position of Chief Prelate came amidst a benevolent lifestyle that involved paying utmost respect to his teachers. The most venerable Mahanayaka rendered an invaluable service for the longevity and the betterment of the Sambuddha Sasana. May the most venerable Agga Mahapandita Napane Pemasiri Thera attain the bliss of Nibbana. Agga Mahapandita Paramapoojaniya Napane Premasiri Mahanayaka Mahapiya Panan Mahanseta Utumu Nivanswa Atpatveva Kya Pratanakala Sri Lankiya the most venerable Mahanayaka rendered an invaluable service to our country and his demise is a loss to us all. I express my deep condolences to the Sri Lanka Ramane sect. May the most venerable Agha Maha Pandita Napane Pemasiri Mahanayaka Thera attain the bliss of Nibbana. Ajaramara Nivan Surat Pevai Mahapratanakara. The remains of the late most venerable Napana Pemasiritera were carried to the cremation chamber. Most venerable Napane Pemasiritera, may you attain the bliss of Nibbana. Chaturanga Hapuarchi now joins us with Action TV. Today on Action TV, our attention is going to be drawn on the Ceylon Electricity Board. The Minister of Power has sent out a cabinet memorandum with the heading resolving the salary issue in respect of the salary of the employees of the CEB. What is this salary issue that they are talking about? To explain that story to you, we have to go back to 2015. The 8th of January 2015, the day the presidential election was held, there was a new salary scale that was introduced at the CEB. Now, the process that was followed to introduce this new salary scale was also questionable where the executive level and above will receive a higher salary. That was what was done through this new e-scale that was introduced. Now, not only the media, several parties including the CEB itself found fault with this new salary scale that was introduced. A trade union attached to the CEB took this matter up with the uh, appeals court and they went to the appeals court and talked about this and on the 2nd of April 2019 the appeals court provided a verdict with regard to this e-scale. They made this new introduced e-scale null and void. What does this mean? This means that when this new 
e scale is taken out of the equation the system that existed before it was introduced comes back into play now that is not what the ceb did ceb continued this e scale for over 19 months now for the second time employees trade unions attached the ceb took this matter up with the appeals court now that judicial process is going on on one side now if this continues further this is a contempt of court that is what the trade unions attached to the ceb are saying before the appeals court let that be on the side it is against such a backdrop that the minister sends out a document like this now in this the recommendations are clearly saying that the salary scale that was introduced on the 20 on the on the 8th of january 2015 is what they are requesting once again now what is the plan here what is the game plan the game plan is as follows in 2021 the collective agreement or the CEB employees, the engineers attached to the CEB, is to be reviewed, it's to be renegotiated. And on that day, what should be based in terms of the salary scale is not the one that was introduced in 2015 and not the one that was made null and void by the appeals court in 2019, but the system or the scale that existed before that. Now, if they are using the cabinet of ministers, the cabinet of ministers that is answerable to the people of this country for their petty gains that should not be accepted. And the people will watch closely if in 2021, when the collective agreement is taken up for debate, when it's taken up for renegotiations, whether they will base it on this particular salary scale or whether, do it, whether they will do it the proper way. Matthew Brand, a Republican federal judge nominated by former President Barack Obama, has dismissed an attempt by Donald Trump in Pennsylvania to prevent the state from certifying their vote. He stated that the case amounted to strained legal arguments without merit and speculative accusations. Since Biden was declared the winner two weeks ago, Trump has launched a barrage of lawsuits and mounted a pressure campaign to prevent states from certifying their vote totals. So far, attempts to thwart certification have failed in courts in Georgia, Michigan and Arizona. After the court setback in Pennsylvania, President Donald Trump now faces increased pressure from his fellow Republicans to drop his effort to overturn the U.S. presidential election and concede to Democrat Joe Biden. For Trump to have any hope of remaining in the White House, he needs to eliminate Biden 81,000 vote lead in Pennsylvania. The state is due to begin certifying its results tomorrow. Biden has 6 million more votes than Trump in the November 3rd election and also prevailed 306-232 in the state-by-state -state electoral college system that determines who will take the oath of office on January 20th, 2021. Joe Biden has spent the past several weeks preparing to take office, though Trump's administration has refused to provide funding and security clearances to do so. The final rights of News First journalist Chandramati Kulandival, whose sudden demise shocked the hearts of many, will take place at Kandakatya in Kandy tomorrow. She was 29 years old at the time of her demise on Friday. Chandramati Kulandavil was born in the Kandyan town of Pusallava on the 7th of July in 1991. She completed her primary education at the Pupurasa Tamil College and her secondary education at the Hindu National College in Pusallava. During her schooling career, Chandramati excelled in several co-curricular activities and won the hearts of her schoolmates and teachers. She graduated with a degree from India's SSM College of Arts and Science and Venture into the field of journalism by joining the Thinnakural newspaper. Chandramathi, who joined News First in 2016, tied the knot to her beloved husband, Subramaniam Saravana, that year. During her four-year tenure at News First, she remained an active journalist who remained committed to ensuring the people's right to information. As a determined reporter and a producer, Chandramathi fulfilled her responsibilities to the fullest, disregarding the medical conditions that stood her way. She extended her contribution beyond the newsroom by being an active member of the Gammadha movement that walked the country to bring a smile on the faces of the people. Her contribution to the Sahanayatra operation that functioned to provide relief to the people 
at times of natural disasters is another testament to her commitment. Chandramati's sudden demise, that was the result of a long-standing medical condition, has sent shockwaves across the newsroom at News First and has left behind immense grief in the hearts of many beloved colleagues. As an individual who left an indelible mark in the hearts of many, dear Chandramati Kulandivel, may you rest in peace. And that's a wrap of Primetime News for tonight. For the News First team, I'm Dasniya Tharda, along with our interpreter Taraka Gabriel. Good night.